webinar on active shooter armed assailants response, training for the DHS run hide fight protocol presented by our sponsor Heffernan. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Deb Beto and I will be your moderator today and be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discuss can be found at the URL that you see on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. If you have audio difficulties or a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the questions or chat box during the webinar. If you are using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation at the end of the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or questions during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one-hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout, and the presenter will be answering questions at the end. And lastly, we have a number of webinars upcoming covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, the Active Shooter Armed Assailants Response Training for the DHS Run Hide Fight Protocol. I'm going to turn the presentation over to our presenter so that we can get the presentation up. And while Dr. Albrecht is getting the presentation up, I will uh, do his introduction here. Dr. Steve Albrecht is one of the country's leading experts on workplace violence. In 1994, he wrote he co-wrote Ticking Bomb, one of the first books on this subject. Since then, he has continued to write, speak, and train on workplace and school violence prevention, the value of threat assessment teams, and safety and security of all employees. His clients include Boeing, Nike, Halliburton, 120 California cities, and all 58 California counties. His background includes his work for 15 years as a police officer with San Diego PD. He holds a doctorate in business administration, an MA in security management, a BA in English, and a BS in psychology. He is board certified in HR, security management, employee coaching, and threat management. He has written 17 books on business, security, and law enforcement subjects. It will be my pleasure to turn the presentation over to Steve Albrecht, but before we do that, I'd like to ask a few polling questions just to find out who we have in the audience. So we're going to ask three questions here, and the first question is, have you seen the Department of Homeland Security video, Run, Hide, Fight? So if you can use your voting button to let us know whether that is a yes or no answer to that question, we'll have two questions that follow this one, so keep your voting buttons ready. Uh, we've got about 75% of the people that have voted, and 17% say yes, and 83% say no. So our next polling question, does your organization have a workplace violence awareness, prevention, and response policy? <clears throat> I know you would like to see an I don't know up there, but we're, right now we're going to be using just a simple yes, no. So if you don't know, just say no. Okay, we have another 75% of the people that have voted. So 25% of you need to get your voting buttons ready for the next question. And 39% say yes, and 61% say no. So, Dr. Albrecht, the last question here. Has your organization 
ever conducted an active shooter drill. This will be our last polling question, um, and we're going to be answering any other questions that you have at the end of the presentation. So be sure to stay until the end. And we've got now nice, we've got about 85% of the people that have voted and 10% say yes, while 90% say no. I don't think that's very surprising, is it Dr. Albrecht? Dr. Albrecht, are you there? I am. Okay, Thanks for great. taking the polls, right? Sure. And we're all set, everybody. Thanks for taking the poll information and, and welcome to the program. Thanks for spending some time today. Um, I hope the background noise is not too bad. I'm in an airport lounge in Phoenix. I just got off the flight and this is the quietest place I can find. So thanks for your time and attention today. This subject is complex and it's also driven by a number of events that we have seen on uh, around this country and around the United States and around Europe and other places as well, where we've seen workplace violence, school violence, terrorism. And so the good news about these issues, at least in the United States, is these things are rare, but they are catastrophic. And so I'd like to talk about what our protocols are for this response, which is typically going to be driven by the Department of Homeland Security national protocol, which is the run, hide, fight video. So the fact that 17% of you have seen the video is great news. The other 83% of you, the rest of you, it's an easy video to watch. It's not bloody or violent, particularly there's a shotgun shooting scene in the beginning, but that's it's a kind of stage. It's Hollywood. The guy that is doing it looks like he's Vin Diesel with the bald head and the shotgun. I encourage people to look at the video, not only as a staff when they work in an office environment, but look at it in uh, the home environment as well, age appropriate. Bring uh, kids maybe 14, 15, 16 year old and above and show them the video and talk about what well, we might do the same protocol at church, at the mall, at the restaurant at a um, public place like a movie theater where these events may happen. Um, I've been involved with this subject for 25 years. We never talked about this back in 25 years ago, but Columbine and other incidents, the Las Vegas shooting, the Parkland school shooting just a couple months ago, have really reoriented our thought process about what the safety and security response is for organizations, for schools, for public and private entities. So thanks for your time and attention today. Um, you can see my contact information is on the screen here. I can certainly take other email questions from you if I don't get to them at the end of our conversation today. Thanks to African Insurance and Aspen Risk Management for bringing me on board. I do this program once a year for them, and I'm always happy to do so. So as Deb suggested, my claim to fame for this subject is I wrote one of the first books in the country on workplace violence, along with uh, a psychologist in San Diego, Michael Mantel. Uh, Mantel was the San Diego police psychologist. He was also Oprah's Dr. Phil before there was a Dr. Phil. Mantel worked on the San Ysidro shooting, which was the worst um, mass murder in the history of the United States in 1984, where a perpetrator killed 21 people at the McDonald's. Um, I, I uh, knew him back then when I was in the PD, and then afterwards, um, in 1992, a, a man named Robert Mack shot and killed two people at the General Dynamics in San Diego. I interviewed him in prison in 93, and the book came out in 94. Uh, the book did fairly well, but people really didn't think about the subject because it was connected to the post office. In fact, the postmaster general wrote the forward for our book, and really we saw not much evolution away from that idea of postal, going postal or post office shootings until about 99, when Columbine came and really changed our perspective about not only managing these events, but responding to them from a police side as well, which was before we would wait for the SWAT team. Now, as you know, the police department, they gather up as many officers, sheriff's deputies as they can. They go inside and engage. I've written another book called Fear and Violence on the Job. I wrote a book called Crisis Management for Corporate Self-Defense. I also have a specialty area, which is I focus on libraries and security in library functions and library facilities. And I help them with the same issues that we're talking about here, which is it's workplace violence prevention and, and keeping people safe in a public environment. As you know from libraries, they can't particularly pick their customers, so they get who they get, who comes in the door, sometimes very problematic in their behavior. So one of the reasons that we do discussions like this, and I'm using up an hour of your time today, is to talk about the value of training under stress. Now, certainly this is not stress inoculation training like we do for firefighters or for cops or for combat veterans, things like that. But the idea of stress inoculation training says 
we put people in situations where they have to know what to do under stress. And so we'll talk about some of those things so that you know that under stress, you go back to how you have been trained. That's why watching the run, hide, fight video has such value because it puts you in a mindset or a or discussion point about what you would do if this particular type of event came to your facility. So we attend trainings to change our behavior under stress so that we know what to do in a life-threatening situation. We don't do things like, you know, that must be fireworks or a backfire, or we, we don't put ourselves in denial and say things like, well, that must not be happening because that couldn't possibly happen here. Under stress, we go back to what we have been told, what we have been taught, what our patterns are. And so if you can imprint the run, hide, fight concept into your mindset, you and your coworkers, so that the rare possibility that this ever happens, you'll be farther along and more prepared than somebody who has not. So the reason we do training is to bring in the run, hide, fight concept in a way that people know, kind of like a fire drill or an earthquake drill, this is what we do. Think about, for an example, in your facility, if you'd have to dial nine first to get an outside line, or can you dial just 911? If you were able to use the phone system in an emergency, some people forget to dial that first nine in an emergency, and then they don't understand why they keep getting extension 11. We've seen phone systems where you have to dial eight or some other number to get an outside line and under stress, that'd be really hard for me to remember. So when we think about why we do certain things in, in emergency situations, we want to make it easier to remember. That's why Run, Hide, Fight is so memorable because it is something that under stress, we can remember those three steps. When you think about um, how connected we are to our cell phones, the idea of cell phone use in our business world and out in public and out in you know, our, our private lives is so connected that we always think about 911 from a cell phone perspective. Who answers that cell phone? It's going to be in some cities, it might be the police department. In some cities, it might be the sheriff's department or a fire agency. Um, in California, it's typically the highway patrol are the ones that answer the 911 calls. And so think about who answers your calls and what, who may be available to respond in those situations where we say, um, does the PD answer? And the answer is probably not. If you have a landline phone in your office or in your facility, the police department or the sheriff or the fire department may answer that landline. But for 911, it could be the state police, it could be the highway patrol. So one of the things we need to figure out is who's going to answer that call because there could be a tremendous delay sometimes in how we hand off those calls from emergency department to emergency department. So my thought process most of the time for emergency situations is if we have the possibility and the availability to use a landline and we're safe doing so, then use that. So one of the things about routines in stress situations, whether it's a fire or an earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado or some other weather event or an active shooter is that we get into patterns and patterns of habit about where we typically come and go from our facility. We always park in the same spot in the parking lot. We typically always come through the same door. In, a, in the rare possibility of an active shooter situation, where would you go to in, enter the building or leave the building? Or what would you do if the entry point or exit point that you typically use was blocked? Sometimes people get into patterns where they say, I only know two ways in the building and two ways out. And you say, well, if I was on the higher floor and the situation was above me, would I leave the building? Probably so. If I was on a, on a higher floor and the situation was below me, then I would stay where I was. So I think it's important to not create a sense of paranoia about this issue, but, but really create an idea that you say, what is my response under stress and the rare possibility that these things happen? where I would go to get out of the building, where I would go to hide out inside the building. We'll talk about the concept of the safe room, which is break room, restroom, conference room, supervisor's office, training room, some place to be in a life-threatening emergency where you can, you can shelter in place until the arrival of the police. What we know about these situations with these perpetrators is that there is a window of time that they have in their head. It's kind of an imaginary clock that ticks inside their head which is about five to 10 minutes. And they know that they have about five to 10 minutes before the local police will arrive in force to engage with them. And so that window of time for them to do the damage they wanna do is, is critical. When we think about what we do to protect ourselves in that span of time, if we can't get out of the building, which would be the first choice, hiding out would be the second, second best thing. And then the third choice, of course, is fighting back. So if you're in a multi-story building, where would you go up or down to protect yourself or to shelter in place? Where would you go to leave the building safely and successfully? Could you get out of the building from a, from a second floor 
where it maybe attaches to another building or something like that. So think about what your thought processes are when it comes to this situation, the rare possibility that, that it may occur. We always want to have some sense in, in mind where we would go up, down, in or out to be safe, to move ourselves away from the attacker and move ourselves out of the way of the police. That's why we do the run, hide, fight concept to get out of the way of the bad guy or woman who is armed with a gun or a knife or another weapon to get out of the way of the responding police. And the police want to come and save us, but we've got to get out of their way so they can do that. The second possibility is hiding out where we hide from the perpetrator in a room that we can barricade as best as we can using chairs and furniture and things like that so that we're A, out of the way of the responding police and we're out of the way of the attacker. We've seen no no evidence in these types of cases in the 25 years that we've reviewed them that these people shoot through the lock like, like a James Bond movie. We see no evidence that they push through a barricaded area to come inside and harm people. If they can't get inside, they typically move on. So if we can put a number of heavy objects in front of the door, if we can cut the lights, if we can move away from that fatal funnel, which is the doorway, we're going to survive these incidents. And then the third choice, of course, is to fight back and using whatever you have in the room that's heavy or sharp or hot, like coffee or books or things that we can do to disorient or, or attack this person, especially as a group, we're going to win that fight. When we think about these perpetrators, what we know from the study around the country and around the world is that they are there to kill people and not to talk. This is not a hostage negotiation. There will be no sort of SWAT team, sort of hostage, you know, FBI hostage negotiation thing like we see in the movies. These incidents are very fast. They end quickly and they will um, be over with usually within five to ten minutes of the arrival of the police. These perpetrators kill themselves or they are killed by the cops. So it's not a hostage situation. It's a protect yourself situation. This window of time that we have to protect ourselves is typically five to 10 minutes before the arrival of the police. The police are going to engage with these people. Now, if you work in a rural location where the police response time could be 15 or 50 minutes, you're in a different situation completely. But for most people in city and county um, organizations where you're, you have police coverage, paramedics, firefighters, and cops are going to be in the scene fairly quickly. As a sort of point of, of, of memory about this issue, when we had the San Bernardino shootings that killed the folks at the Christmas party, uh, there were 300 cops that came to that situation all told. And so there'll be police coming from a number of agencies, CHP, Highway Patrol, state police, railroad cops, college police, community college police, local PD, sheriff's department, um, Border Patrol Customs, wherever you, you have law enforcement, they're going to respond to this because that's what they do. So if we can get out of the line of sight of the perpetrator, out of his or her way so that we can barricade or shelter or evacuate, we're going to temp typically survive these events. So the police response is a unique issue because sometimes we anticipate the cops are going to wear what you know cops wear, which is blue uniforms, but they may come from other agencies that wear typically different colored uniforms. In California, for example, the Iowa Patrol wears tan uniforms. Uh, sheriff's departments oftentimes wear tan shirts and green pants, but sometimes they wear all black pants or, or uh, PD wears blue. Customs wears a different color blue. Border Patrol wears all green. There could be a cornucopia of cops coming in different uniforms. Some may be in plain clothes some in, in um, undercover or detective type type of functions. You know, it could be a guy with a, a ball cap and a goatee with a vest on. You may see them carrying firearms, like ranging from handguns to rifles to, you may see helmets, you may see ballistic shields. The reason we talk about this is sometimes under stress, we think of the police as being obvious and we would recognize them right away. But in the San Bernardino incident, after the shooters came through, the husband and wife team, they were wearing all black and carrying assault weapons. The next group of people that came through the door were wearing dark dark clothing and carrying assault weapons. They thought it was the second wave of attackers. Turns out it was the San Bernardino cops coming to rescue them. So there's a mindset that you have to put yourself into. Would you say, if I see the cops in this scenario, they could be wearing completely different uniforms than I might recognize from agencies that I don't typically know. You need to be ready for that. One of the things that we're seeing in these events is the response by the paramedics and the firefighters is typically going to be delayed until the police have cleared the building. And this could take a substantial amount of time and, and sadly people may bleed out in those situations. What we are seeing around the country is something called the Hartford Protocol. And the Hartford Protocol is where 
we now train employees, and I've been through the training myself, I did it last month, in something called Stop the Bleed. And there's a, an organization called StopTheBleed.org, and StopTheBleed.org does a one-hour training program where they teach people from all walks of life and in lots of businesses to come in and just a one-hour program to use tourniquets which we're now using quite effectively to save lives because the number one reason people die in traumatic situations, whether it's shooting or accidents, is they bleed to death. So if we can get people to use tourniquets effectively, we also train in the Stop the Bleed program for them to use um, wound packing so that we can pack anything into the wound that stops the bleeding, like a t-shirt or you know gauze or whatever we have at our availability in our first aid kits, we're gonna save people's lives. So what we're seeing around this country is two things. One. Paramedics and firefighters are now trying to get into the situations faster by coming in right behind the police. And also we're using more stop the bleed training to get people to um, understand the use of tourniquets and how to, how to save people's lives from bleeding to death. So I encourage you, if you have interest in this issue, kind of like CPR and like AEDs, we're now seeing tourniquet training is coming forward. One of the things that we're seeing with AED machines now is some first aid kit people are putting tourniquets in the AED machines as well. So not only do we have the possibility of the CPR, but the tourniquets in the AED and first aid devices, which I think is a good trend. So think about how Stop the Bleed may be an effective lunchtime training program in your organization. When we talk about these situations with the police dispatchers, it's really, really important that we give them as much information as we can over the time span that we can as safely as possible and as quietly and carefully as possible not to reveal your location or to draw the perpetrator towards you, but we want to give as much information to the dispatchers so they can tell their responding cops through their mobile data terminals and dispatch as they come in what these people are wearing, what kind of <laughs> weapons they're holding, and what type of incident that we're facing. The fact that these events are hugely stressful and rare puts you into a situation where you say, how would I communicate on my cell phone or through landline to the emergency responders so I know exactly what they need to know? And so these are some of the things that they're specifically looking for. So the last thing on this slide is I think very, very significant here, which is these people are not Navy SEALs, they're not Marine commandos, the people that are doing these things are oftentimes confused dipsticks that get, get access to their parents' guns. They're depressed. They have no social connections. They're highly narcissistic. Um, they're suicidal oftentimes and homicidal as well, which makes them dangerous. But we can fight back and beat them. And we see this around the country where there are situations where um, people have thrown things at them and attacked them with chairs and furniture and just use group mass to knock them down and, and hold them until the PD gets there. Our attempt here is not to be you know, uh, heroic and make an arrest. Our attempt is to save our own life by saying, you know what, I wanna go home and see my family and people I care about. We can beat these people. One guy with a gun who walks around and shoots people who are laying on the floor and trying to play dead is a mistake. And I will never ever, in my perspective, give the advice that you should, you should give up to these people and not fight back. Collectively, the groups of us, especially in a room where these people come in, the lights are off, they're disoriented, they don't have any sense of what's going on and where the people are, we can fight back and beat them. And I want you to think about that as a significant part of this run, hide, fight. The fight is just as important as the other as the other two. Although we start first with getting out of the building and second, sheltering in place, but the fighting part is just as important. I hope that makes sense to you. So when we talk about this subject of workplace violence, it's interesting sometimes to look at the news media's perspective about this and what, what we see for how people typically anticipate what these cases are. And what we usually see is, is most people think it's category three, current or former employees that are doing these cases. And in reality, it's category one. 50% of workplace violence is crooks. People that provide um, service that we provide services to in category two is 25%. Category three, current or former employees is about 20%. And sadly, the last category, category four, domestic violence involving an employee is about 5% of our cases. Now, I think category four is hugely underreported because many employees are fearful, especially female employees that have a domestic violence situation, are fearful that they'll be fired if they bring this to the attention of their supervisor or boss. In California, we have something called Senate Bill 400, which says if you are a victim of domestic violence as an employee, you can't be fired for that. It's a protected class. And so 
we have not only a duty to keep you safe, but we have to create a safety plan as well. So when we look at these categories broken down, category one, crooks, 50%, category two, people we provide services to, typically the most dangerous people inside category two are patients. Uh, pe people in healthcare environment can talk about how difficult and scary and dangerous the emergency room is on a Friday night. And we've seen a lot of movement and, and changes in the laws and policies that are really connected to OSHA's involvement with healthcare and how important healthcare protection is for employees that work in all phases of providing healthcare to, to angry, threatening, violent, potentially dangerous patients. So that's been a movement, especially around the country in the last um, three months, which is a positive thing. If you look at category three, current or former employees, that's sort of the news media's perspective about, about how they see this subject. That's actually pretty rare. And then category four, I think, is underreported. And we need to make some changes around this country to make all 50 states have domestic violence protection for employees as a protected class. Currently, eight states in the United States, including California, have that perspective. But why it's not all 50 is, is uh, baffling to me. If you're a victim of domestic violence, sometimes people are fearful that their employer will find out about the situation and they'll get fired. So they don't say anything. And then we figure out that one of our employees has a restraining order against her boyfriend or ex-husband when he shows up in the lobby. And then that's when the complex starts. So I always tell people in the training environment, if you have a domestic violence situation and there is a chance this person could come to your employer, come to you where you are at work, you got to tell somebody, whether it's security or human resources or your boss or your boss's boss or department director, you got to have that conversation, which is hard, but we have the right to get involved in people's personal lives when it affects work, and these situations definitely affect the workplace. So the FBI has done a study over a span of about 13, 14 years. They've looked at mass attacks across the United States, and they've said, what do we see in terms of the trend? I'm no statistician, but if you look, the trend line is certainly up. Um, the FBI just did a study in 2017 where they looked at some of the mass attack characteristics. This includes also the, the Las Vegas shooting where 58 people were killed, but the numbers are certainly going up from an injury and death perspective and certainly going up from the number of incidents. And so what I always hear from people, especially during training, is do we have more of these incidents or are they just more reported? And I think the answer is both. I, I certainly see and more incidents that maybe it would not have made the news because of there's not a large casualty count in smaller communities and things like that, certainly now becoming national news. But I also know that some of these perpetrators have looked at these previous incidents and say, how do I get on TV? And the way I get on TV or get around, get on the international news around the planet, around the world is to be worse than the previous guy. So people in my work are frequently concerned about the news media's coverage of these events to create a sense of these perpetrators wanting to outdo each other and they do idolize each other and they write about and talk about and post and share what they have seen other people do and that's disturbing to us especially from law enforcement how do we keep out of these people if you look at this chart and it talks about the number of of uh, incidents by category the good news is most workplace violence as we talked about in that when i looked at showed you the four different types one two three and four is commerce. And so almost half of the cases that the FBI looked at over a 13, 14 year period tends to be gas stations, liquor stores, donut shops, things like that. Left hand side of the chart tends to be education, um, schools, K through 12, colleges and universities, government facilities, military bases, churches, things like that. But the right hand side tends to be more about commerce. And so if you're working in a business where there's there's um, jewelry stores, liquor stores, gas stations, donut shops, things like that. You have a higher risk of robbery, but for everybody else, the workplace violence piece, almost 50% of it goes away. So one, one good thing to look at that is to say, okay, do we have a sense of this perspective of these cases? And, and I think this chart kind of gives us kind of a reality check about where these things typically happen. <clears throat> I'm typically asked by people all the time, why? people do these things, why these perpetrators do these things. And I'm always driven by a chart that comes from some colleagues of mine, Steve Weston and Ted Calhoun. They belong to a group that I belong to called ATAP, the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals. And ATAP has been around since 1992. 
we do uh, work in domestic violence, workplace violence, school violence prevention, and terrorism. And this group of folks, about 2,000 of us in the United States, are always focusing on what we can learn from these cases and what research. And we have a, a conference every year where we talk about previous cases and what to do. So this model of this pathway to violence, I think if you look at other cases, whether it's at a school or a college or a hospital or um, a movie theater or some public place or like a mall or in an organization, we see the same types of things coming over and over again in terms of these perpetrators' behaviors. They start with a grievance, some type of sense of anger towards the person or the situation. They got fired, they got their heart broken, they got disciplined, demoted, they got passed over for a promotion, somebody else at the workplace bullied them or at the school. When we look at the next step, it's up to a violent ideation. Everybody that's listening to this phone call, including me, has had a violent ideation for about five seconds or so, and then we go back to reality and we go, nah, we'd never do that. You know, somebody cuts you off on the freeway, you think about having a cannon and blowing a small hole in the back of their car, but then you look and you go, oh, coffee, and then we're back to reality. These people, their violent ideations last weeks, months, and even years. And how do we know this? We look at their writings, we look at their postings, we look at the things that, that are connected to their pre-attack behaviors. So a good chunk of these folks never get past the violent ideation stage, we never hear about them, but then the small number moves into research and planning, they get guns or bombs or other things to prepare themselves, they practice their attack and then they do the attack. If you look to the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a collection of escalating behaviors, um, broken heart, divorce, financial loss, um, family loss, something like that, um, getting kicked out of their house if they're a kid. And then we look at a collection of de-escalating behaviors like main treatment and support and access to mental health counseling and access to mental health medications and, and family support and, and helping people that are depressed or have suicidal thoughts and things like that. We can de-escalate these cases. The problem in threat assessment is we don't often know what works and we don't know what de-escalates people and we don't typically know you know, of all the things that we try in the threat assessment process, what actually stops them. That's why when I work on cases for threat assessment, I may talk about 20 or 25 things that we do just to make it possible that this person doesn't act out. So the escalating factors could be cultural things that are happening within the work culture or the school culture, especially things like bullying or, or poor treatment. But really think about how from like an HR perspective or a school discipline perspective, we can treat people with humanity, give them options and not make it seem like their world is falling apart if we have to take some types of steps in terms of discipline, expulsion, termination, things like that. The good news about these cases is they are catastrophic and but, but rare. And so they're still, um, again, better chance of being struck by lightning than you do of being involved in a workplace violence incident. 95 people a day die of opiate overdoses in this country. Um, 16 kids per day die in traffic accidents that are involved texting. Um, more children are killed by things falling off of dressers and counters onto them than are killed in school violence incidents. But the news media really likes to get around this issue. The problem is a, one of these cases in the United States is catastrophic, and that's why we have to have a run, hide, fright protocol. So most of these perpetrators are... <coughs> Sorry, most of these perpetrators are males and they're lone wolves, and meaning that they don't typically act with other people. The reason they don't act with other people is if they talked about their plan, it's going to be revealed. So we don't oftentimes see multiple perpetrators. Columbine is an example. Uh, San Bernardino is an example. The Marathon Bombers in Boston is an example. We did see multiple perpetrators, but it is highly rare. No shooter has ever breached the door to kill people. No shooter has ever shot through the door to get people, no shooters ever pretended to be the police. And I get those questions all the time. Sometimes what we do see is, uh, as in the Sandy Hook Elementary School case where the perpetrator shot through a glass door to get inside the school and then went into the first unlocked classroom that he found and killed the kids in the classroom. What we see now in this country is a solid movement towards giving teachers and other staff members the ability to lock classrooms from the inside and to barricade the doors and to keep the kids away. If you have kids in, in K through 12 age, they, they know the run, hide, fight protocol better than we do. And we teach run, hide in schools and we teach the adults the fight part. We don't teach kids, you know, we don't have an eight year old grab somebody's leg. We teach the kids in K through 12 environment run, hide. We teach run, hide, fight for colleges, universities, businesses, and we teach the adults working in a campus environment about the fight part. But for kids, we teach run, hide, which is typically shelter in place if they can't, if they can't um, 
get to the safety of the classroom to shelter than we want them to flee. We can't predict violence. We can't guess what people are going to do, but we can certainly look at this path that I talked about from ideas to actions. We can certainly an anticipate what people are going to do based on what we call leakage. And this leakage is an interesting concept. It doesn't come from a direct threat to the target. Leakage comes when someone says something about the target. So when the kid wants to shoot the football coach, he doesn't tell the football coach. He, that would cause consequences for him. He tells his friends. The challenge is to get the people in the school that hear, heard this threat to tell the adults and to tell people using either tip lines or we tip or Crime Stoppers or some other hotline that we can put in schools that, that give people a chance to call in and say, here's what I heard. I don't know what it means, but I wanted to tell somebody about it. Because oftentimes, and you may know this from seeing your own review of these cases, sometimes people tell us about this leakage after the case has happened. So I'm always interested in any kind of leakage in the organization or a school where someone says, here's what I'm going to do. And the question for our everybody listening and for our employees and for students is, can you have the courage with a capital C to be able to go forward and tell people when you hear about this type of leakage? One of the problems of leakage is that sometimes we say he was just kidding, or he wouldn't really do that, or I didn't think he would, would we had meant it, and so we don't tell anybody. It's important that we have partnerships in place with our safety and security stakeholders, which is typically human resources and security, if it's a function in your organization, risk management, company attorneys, if that's a function in your organization, department directors, senior leadership that can say, what did we hear and what does it mean in context? Do we need to get together in a threat assessment team approach, which is to talk about things from a stakeholder position and decide what to do? So threat assessment teams don't have to necessarily be created in a way where they're formalized, where we have specific job duties, but oftentimes we can say, can we get the safety and security stakeholders together to talk about this leakage, to talk about what we've heard and figure out what our plan is? Maybe part of the threat assessment team discussion is, is liaison conversations with law enforcement in our community. Maybe it's, it's partnerships with our employee assistance program, EAP providers, or mental health providers that work for our organization. I'm a big fan of EAP, and we'll talk about that as well. But I'm also um, asking employees and supervisors and managers to be vigilant and to listen to this leakage and also to have a sense of safety and security for all the facility, whether it's customers, taxpayers, visitors, vendors, ex-employees, current employees, domestic violence involving employees, so that we pay attention to those things which have the capacity or possibility to move up this, this, this kind of movement from ideas to action. And then within that, we have a training discussion with policy. So almost 40% of you have a policy, which I was glad to hear about, 60% don't. There's lots of good boilerplate policies out there, <clears throat> which are good for human resources people to model for as, a, as a policy for workplace violence response in our organizations. And it's not just about run, hide, fight or evacuation. It's things about you know bringing weapons to work or firearms policy, <clears throat> what we do for threats that come to our employees from outsiders, what our response is for threats that come from, from inside the organization, current or former employees, and then how do we create a sense of, of a plan for evacuation, a plan for emergency response, a plan for contacting law enforcement. And then in my perfect world, we practice once a year. We, we do a drill, a run, hide, fight drill once per year where all we need to do is replicate the run part and the hide part. So I'll talk about this in a second, but it's a 15 minute drill, like a fire drill. We say, we're gonna practice this. We don't need to do the fight part, but we'll practice the run and hide once a year, just to remind people this is what we do in our organization. So going back to run, hide, fight, this is a barricade at UCLA in California. The UCLA campus had a shooting. A professor was killed by an ex-student. And so some folks here, tied some cable to the top of the door frame. They barricaded the door. Again, bad guy is not pushing through all this stuff to come inside. When they come into this type of situation, they're gonna move on. They move to the next open classroom, open office, open area that they can get to. Ohio State University had an active attacker situation involving a car and a guy with a knife. He was killed by campus police. Um, this was the, the barricade situation that some of the kids in, my, in the classroom put in. And when they put this barricade up, you can understand that because there's a clock ticking inside these guys' head, they're not going to come forward and push through all the stuff to get into the classroom to engage with people. They're going to move on to the next area. So we know that barricades work.
you can see from this this cornucopia of people here that we see a wide variety of ages, sexes, races um, of people that do these things across the country and, and around the world. We've seen these perpetrators in different sizes and shapes. So again, we're not into profiles, we're into behaviors. I don't care what people look like, I care what they do. So one of the things that the news media is stuck on is the idea of the profile and what we want to focus on is behaviors. And that's why we talk about this leakage piece. So I get this all the time. Why do these people do these things? And so it's a lot of D's up there, disconnected and disaffected and depressed. Depressed people are typically dangerous to themselves, driven to act. They have a desire for revenge based on how they were treated or bullied um, in the workplace or in the school. They're desperate and they're dangerous. They have early psychopathy. It's typically diagnosed at age 18, but these folks show early signs of psychopathy. They're narcissistically uh, dangerous or narcissistically entitled, which means they can hurt other people and not feel bad about it. They don't have any sense of empathy or regard for others in terms of their own life, and they have what's, what my clinician friends call the broken bridge of self-esteem. The broken bridge of self-esteem says, I don't care about my own life, literally, and I don't care about the lives of other people, so I can harm myself or harm other people, and I don't care. Um, everybody that, that you know you know in your life and that, that, that you associate with has empathy for each other, and we care for each other as human beings folks don't. Um, so they say, I want to outdo my idols. I want international attention. I want to be infamous. You know, Lady Gaga is famous. I want to be infamous. You can only kill me once. My actions will live on. And I'm going to post and write and talk about what I'm going to do with diaries and Facebook posting and things like that. So that when I'm gone, people will talk about my plan and, and what I did. And they, they want this sort of infamy, which, which we attach to these folks around the, around the country and around the world. So many years ago, I got sort of inspired to write what I thought was a manifesto for how these people see their approach to what they do and see if this makes sense to you. I've lived a depressed, disconnected, disaffected life with no real job, girlfriend, supportive family structure or goals. That's a bad sign. And one of the things we see for a lot of these perpetrators based on an FBI study was no father figure in, in like 23 out of the 24 cases they looked at. Because of this, I hate people and they seem to dislike me. I've collected the whole the many injustices directed me my whole life. And so the injustice collectors, you know, their favorite phrase is, it's not fair or I'm getting screwed. I'll kill as many people as I can for my revenge. I'll dress like a commando. And just because they have the outfit doesn't, doesn't mean that they are. I'll mimic my idols that killed before me so that people remember me and talk about my actions for decades. And they'll post photos and words and videos of my discontent online to provide proof of my either my irrational life views, religious zealotry, racial hatred, active and untreated mental illness and my rage against the world. I know the U.S. and international press and instant social media, Facebook, Twitter, etc., will expose me around the globe minutes after I'm dead or in jail because that's what they do. So I'm hopeful you'll see this as kind of a manifesto for all the cases that we've seen, especially in the last, you know, 10 years or so, especially in the last 20 years, almost as we've come up on the 20-year anniversary next year in April for Columbine, that this is sort of the protocol that these people follow. Again, it's not a profile, but these are the behaviors they typically exhibit. So I talked about the value of threat assessment teams in terms of how we get the stakeholders, the, the safety and security stakeholders for the organization together to decide what to do when we see an in internal threat, current or former employee, or an external threat, stranger, taxpayer, customer, um, somebody who has a, a vengeance against the organization or somebody who's a stranger to the organization. Notice that corporate counsel or city attorneys or county, county attorneys or any kind of legal entity that's attached to the agency or organization is the one that keeps the notes for threat assessment team conversations so that we have good attorney-client work privilege. They're not subject to subpoena. And if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, we typically see a core of people that are on the threat assessment team. HR typically drives the threat assessment team. We may invite security if that's a function of the organization, certainly local law enforcement attorneys, employee assistance program, behavioral health clinicians or consultants, psychologists, et cetera, um, insurance, risk management, safety professionals, um, the people that provide IT services for our organization or, or our facilities director as well, because those folks can help us with things like access control and also for the IT department. We we'll certainly look at things like, like ransomware and other attacks that may come that don't necessarily relate to violence. If you look at the rest of the right-hand side of the screen, there's some other people who are stakeholders as well. Managers and supervisors and employees can be interviewed about things that they heard 
certainly we can use threat management, threat assessment consultants, um, folks that, that work in the same type of work that I do are very useful and beneficial in these situations. So for the threat assessment team to be useful, they need to convene fairly quickly after the threat of some magnitude comes to their attention and then figure out what to do. Typically, the folks on the left-hand side of the screen are the drivers for that process. If the threat assessment team members are, as we've discussed, here's what they look at, typically what they focus on. You can see it ranges from people that sue the organization a lot as vexatious litigants, all the way up through to ransomware and cyber threats, bomb threats, domestic violence, discipline terminations, expulsions of students, um, employee bullying or threats to each employee or threats that come to an employee from an outsider, <clears throat> current or form, former employer, visitor, vendor, stranger, and then threats to the organization itself, the leadership, the executive teams, the meeting places. Um, I oftentimes think about city council and county board meetings, things like that. We get together in a threat assessment team conversation, HR, security, law enforcement, risk management, IT facilities to talk about what our plan is. And we can come up with a pretty good plan in a very short period of time. So I encourage people, you don't have to have a spe special specific threat assessment team sort of designation. You say, who are the safety and security stakeholders in your organization? And keeping in mind that those folks may have um, more than one role to play. So you may have, you know, HR may also have a security function as well, for example where you get people in the room and talk about what, what our plan is in this in this time span. So if you look at these characteristics here, one of the things that, that I, again, want to focus on is, again, we're not talking about profiles, we're talking about behaviors. And so these aren't clinical diagnoses here. These are behaviors that we see in an employee or an ex-employee that would give us concern. Depression, religious zealotry, injustice collector, um, drug or alcohol abuse, uh, being bullied, off-the-job issues like divorce, financial problems. Um, guns is not a huge risk factor in my cases, except when the person has no interest in them and suddenly develops an interest in guns without any any um, sort of usual reason for it, like, you know, I need to buy this gun to come protect my job, that kind of stuff would concern me. <clears throat> One of the biggest ones up there in terms of risk factors is somebody who talks about school violence or workplace violence as if it were a good thing. Yeah, that guy that shot up Vegas, he, he's pretty hes pretty tough. Those guys frighten me. That's not a normal empathic human response. Then we talked about this leakage, this third-party threat, where somebody hears something that someone makes a threat to harm somebody else, but not to the target directly. That's what the Secret Service taught me. Many people make threats. Some people pose threats. And we need to focus on people who pose threats as necessarily making threats. <clears throat> the presence of a, a verbal threat is not a huge risk factor for me in every single case, except sometimes when we have domestic violence where we you know someone will say, if I can't have you, nobody else can. But oftentimes my biggest concern are these third party threats. And I'll talk a little bit about hunters versus howlers. Howlers are people that draw attention to themselves. They wanna be provocative. They wanna scare people and disrupt the business, but they don't typically harm people. Hunters are people that work in stealth. They don't reveal themselves. They end up showing up with a gun. Those are the ones that hurt folks. The good news is most people we deal with are howlers. The bad news is oftentimes we hear about the hunters after the incident. <clears throat> so look at these, these characteristics here, these suspicious indicators. From my police days, these are what I would call casing behaviors. These are things that people do before they get ready to commit crimes, but oftentimes in either workplace violence or terrorism concerns, these are things that people might do around our facilities. And what happens is, Sometimes we rationalize these kinds of irrational behaviors. If you see these things around your facility, <clears throat> you don't have to go confront people or taking pictures or something like that, but be a good witness. Capture the information that, that you see around you, be a good witness, tell your boss, tell your coworkers, have the courage to call the cops. Cops love to talk to these people. And the, we wanna figure out whether these behaviors fit the context of the situation. It's the fire marshal or an insurance guy or something like that, or it's somebody who's actually getting ready to do something bad and we've interrupted the opportunity. I bought this UPS uniform at a thrift store by my house. If I was wearing a UPS uniform and pushing a hand truck full of empty boxes, I could probably get into almost any business in the United States and walk around. I could load up the empty boxes with TVs and flat screens and projectors and backpacks and wallets and purses and tablets and computers and probably no one would stop me. So I'm not saying be suspicious of the UPS guy, I'm just saying be suspicious of the UPS guy meaning that if we see people that we don't recognize, ask them for ID. 
if we see vendors that, that are coming in that are not escorted, we ask them, who, who is your contact here? And we have a little bit more protocol rather than just saying, well, it's not my job. We're all in charge of safety and security. And it starts with looking at these kind of access points where people come into our facilities. And it may be perfectly reasonable or it may not. So let's talk about run, hide, fight as we get into our, our wrap up here. Um, I encourage you to watch the video. Um, it's, a, it's a short video, it's six minutes long. I think, you know, age appropriate in your house, you show people in, in your house, talk about what we do as a national protocol for this concept. Run out of the building if you can. If not, hide out in the safest place that you can, break room, restroom, et cetera. And third choice, fight back. The movie was filmed in 2012. It's had about 50 million views. Again, if you put Run, Hide, Fight, Department of Homeland Security into um, YouTube, it'll pop up. It's about six minutes long. There's a scene in the beginning where the guy that looks like Vin Diesel with a shotgun shoots people with, with shotguns. It's not bloody, but if you want to skip that, just move your cursor to about the 90 second point and you can pick it up. Um, the rest of the video is, is perfectly fine to show to people uh, in any workplace. Two of the things I talked about, which I think are important, are at the bottom there, the importance of a 15 minute drill, which is once a year we do a drill where we either leave the building as quickly and safely as possible, or we hide out inside the building. So if I'm running the drill and I don't see you outside the building and I can't get into the room that you're in inside the building, then you've done it correctly. So in my perfect world, like an earthquake drill, like a fire drill, we do the 15 minute drill once per year to remind everybody after a staff meeting conversation about it, that this is what we do for the rare possibility of an active shooter or an active attacker. The second thing, if you look at the bottom, there's a concept here called cover versus concealment. Cover stops bullets, concealment hides you. So cover would be a brick wall or a concrete wall or a staircase that's made out of concrete. Concealment would be blinds or, or tinted glass or a wooden door. We want people to know the difference because we want them to get behind cover as best as possible. Um, the closest you can be to a, a bullet sometimes in these situations and still get shot might be a, up to a quarter mile. So some of these perpetrators are armed with assault weapons and other types of things. You can be too close to the building and still get hit even if you're a quarter mile away. So we want folks to move away from the building, get out of the way of the police, get out of the way of the bad guy, or hide out in the safest room where we have something we can use as cover. And even a bookcase filled with heavy textbooks or law books would be a good example of cover because those things can stop bullets in the right situations. So think about what you would put in front of you and the doorway that would be useful, like a copy machine or something we could shove in front of it that would that would stop bullets as well as block the door. I use code words. I like code words, especially for people that have a public contact jobs where people are upset, maybe in some type of enforcement job, you know, code compliance or park rangers and things like that. If we're in a, in a business where we tell people no a lot, um, I like code words to be able to notify law enforcement, go call Dr. Green or call Mr. Blue or call Arnold as in Schwarzenegger, um, come up with a code word that we use to go safe place and call the police. And also we may use code words for our PA system. So one of the ones that we typically hear is there's an unusual incident in the lobby. There's an unusual incident on the second floor. There's an unusual incident in HR, wherever. That means that there's a potential for somebody with a gun in that part of the facility and don't go there, evacuate immediately once you hear that code word. So remember that the police response to these situations is going to be aggressive and they're not going to be there to provide first aid or help people evacuate. Their function is to go and stop the attacker. And so um, we may need to provide first aid. That could be just putting somebody on a on a rolling chair and, and shoving them out into the parking lot towards ambulances, things like that. You may have to provide first aid. And that's why I talked about the Stop the Bleed campaign, which I think um, is a useful uh, part of new training these days. Along with AEDs and CPR, the StopTheBleed.org is, is a new protocol that we're looking at. So in these situations, we've not seen these perpetrators shoot through the locks or do anything like that. So if we can get behind locked doors, if we can get a barricade situation, get in, if we can stay away from the, the doorway, the fatal funnel, if we can hunker down and wait for the arrival of the police, they're going to typically be there within five to ten minutes and they're going to they're activate their plan and we can fight back and we can stop these people. So think about the difference between cover versus concealment. Think about how some of these perpetrators may target certain people like uh, domestic violence or bullies or people that they can't stand or they, they hate in their workplace. And we're not here to reason with these people. We're here to get outside. We're here to hide out. We're here to fight back. Left-hand side of the screen, useful 
uh, safe room discussion here, right hand side not so much. Left hand side, typically um, things that will will be the best for a safe room conversation, right hand side not so much. Um, left hand side, we've got off the main hallway and we can lock the doors and we have a sturdy door frame and things like that, right hand side not so much. In an imperfect world, if you look at the bottom right, get on the ground, um, cut the lights and be as quiet as possible wait for the attacker to pass by, and if they come inside, fight back, wait for the arrival of the police. <clears throat> so last thing to talk about before I take some questions, um, watch the, VA, the Department of Homeland Security run, hide, fight video. Um, I like it as once a year as a staff meeting conversation. Um, have, show the video and have a discussion about what it means specifically in your organization. Um, age appropriate, show the video at home. Uh, I think, you know, 14, 15, 16 above is okay. Not little kids that are scared to go to school, but but age appropriate. Make sure all staff knows how to dial 911 and our phone systems and what to say in terms of describing behaviors. And make sure that when people dial 911 on their cell phones, they know who's gonna, gonna respond. So, you know, I'm always asking staff members to not wait to tell us of bad things and not to go against their intuition if they hear things that make them concerned and to tell us about it. And then to have a good post evacuation plan, not just to stage by the side of the building and, and you know wait to be harmed by a bad guy, but but get out of um, the building facility as fast as possible and go far far away, and then train themselves to give good information to the dispatchers and to the responding police. Again, think about the Stop the Bleed program, StopTheBleed.org. Again, based on this um, Hartford protocol that was created after the Sandy Hook shooting um, to stop the bleeding with tourniquets and, and that type of thing. I think the training is excellent. It's only an hour. And I went through it and I thought it was very useful. You may consider bringing law enforcement in your community into your business just to have a meeting and say, here's what we do. Is there anything that we need to do differently? Or can you have a conversation with us about some safety procedures as you look at our facility as you have to respond here? And also think about the value and the validity of scheduling a 15 minute drill once a year where you just practice the two parts and the most important, the run part and the hide part. I thought I'd put in a picture of my dog. Since I've been talking about a pretty intense subject, I always like to look at my dog Tink. So thanks for your time and attention, everybody. If I have time for the questions, I'm happy to, to take some. And also uh, you can certainly email me any questions that you have, but I encourage you to watch the video. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht. We will be answering as many questions as we can if you can stay on the line for a few minutes. And sure. if we can't get to your question, we will follow up with an email afterwards. So the first question is, um, in some states, including Washington, employees are prohibited from discussing or revealing an employee's domestic violence status. So how do you warn other employees of potential danger without breaching this confidentiality? I think you have to go on a need-to-know basis. So access control people, receptionists, or security people, the ones that we talk to, other people, and we'd have to keep it on a confidential basis if that's the requirement. But the problem is in these situations, I'd rather be sued for breaching a confidence than to be sued for wrongful death. Yeah. So the people that are in the right, right. position to make, to make responses need to know what to do, and they, they need to know their information. Excellent point. So there's one listener that has had an experience when they felt that they needed to call in what seemed to them a serious threat. The threat was evolved around a mass shooting, and so the listener called the local PD, and they simply told her that they can't do anything about the situation, that there's not enough evidence. Is this a typical response, and how do we avoid mass shootings if our local PD are saying that they can't do anything about it? And I guess, the, you know, that's that's unfortunate, but I think the other part is that we talk in our organization as a group and say, you know, if the police aren't going to do anything, what do we know? And what other information might we want to provide the police that, that does fill in some gaps for them? But I think sometimes um, we need to talk to a higher authority at the PD than just a patrol cop or a dispatcher. Say, you know, I'd like to talk to a lieutenant or a captain or a watch commander and say, you know, we, the reason we're talking about this is important. We're not just, you know, we're not just chatting. And so maybe go higher above than just a patrol cop. Okay. Um, as a society, what can we do to start talking about mental health reform as much as we talk about gun control reform? Yeah, I think that's a critical point. And, and what we're really seeing is is the family breakdown where these perpetrators don't feel connected to anybody in their own families, and they're not getting mental health treatment, they're not getting medications, and, and we have a significant issue in this country with you know not not providing mental health services at the early stages, especially for people who are suicidally depressed which a lot of these perpetrators are. So I'd like to see more more conversation about 
<clears throat> how we get you know mental health clinicians involved in situations instead of waiting till something happens. Mm -hmm. In cases of former employees uh, who knows all the rooms of the facility, is hiding a bad idea? And may, maybe they know all the rules and the code words and everything like that. <clears throat> that, that's why we don't stage outside the building, and that's why we don't set up a specific safe room. So we don't say, everybody go to the break room. Let's go to any place you can. The employee's not going to go to every single room if they're all barricaded. But that's a good point. But that's why we don't set up specific safe rooms. And just a couple of more questions. Are you able to recommend a ballistic shield for office use? Um, I don't know. There's a, a place called the Man Pack. It's M A N hyphen pack um, they sell ballistic shields that are about the size of a laptop computer uh, they're about uh, 100 bucks i have one Th that's a pretty good resource manpack.com okay and what would be the best practice in the movies or an outdoor venue um the run type for of, to type protocol oh, okay yeah for, well a couple things one is we need we need law enforcement and security to to work in partnership for those things and the second is you know keep aware of your surroundings and what's going on in those events. You know, the Las Vegas thing really caught everybody by surprise. But now we have a sense that, you know, where's the safest place to be in an outdoor event? And, I, you know, can you get quickly and safely with you and your family members to an exit area? Okay. And I think you answered this question during the presentation, but we've had a couple of follow-up questions. Do you have any recommendations about how to create an open environment around domestic violence in the workplace? I think there are a lot of uh, resources. The Nas National Center for Domestic Violence is a resource. There's a lot of hotline numbers. Um, a lot of communities have um, victim witness um, liaison relationships with the district attorney's office where they have social workers and people who can provide support <laughs> for DV victims and if they reach out. And I think a lot of it comes through the county. A lot of it comes through a lot of these hotline and and victim advocacy groups that can really be supportive but we need to bring the subject out of you know behind the, the dark darkness okay um so that's most of our questions today uh thank you for attending today's webinar presented by, by heffernan we will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website Thank you, Dr. Steve Albrecht, for your time and expertise today. We hope all of the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. Be sure to join us next time for our Preventing Sexual Harassment webinar on Tuesday, May 22nd. And thank you, everyone, and have a very safe day. Thanks, everybody.